For tapes, CDs, DVDs, to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Sunday morning, July 1984, summer family camp meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Doc Egan is the speaker of the morning. Well, I'll, I'll turn the balance of the morning to Doc Egan, who we're glad they came by to be with us this weekend and to open up the word of the Lord to us. And we just appreciate his ministry and his wife, and we bless them this morning. Doc Aiken from uh, Golden, Golden, Mississippi. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Bless Hallelujah. You. Bless you. How, much, how much time have I got? Well, all day. All day. If, we, all day. if anybody, if, if anybody has to go, all day. if anybody has to go, they're welcome just to leave when they feel they need to go. It's 20 minutes to 11. I promise you I'll quit at 12. But I've got two sermons that I want to preach to you. I'll teach to you. Maybe I'll teach. See, preaching is marvelous, and I'm a born preacher. I love to preach, but when I do, I entertain your spirit. And I very seldom touch your mind. When you go home, you sober up, and the spirit goes back to its old law, and you forget about what I said. But if I teach and I get it into your mind, then you don't forget it. Okay? Okay, let me give you some sermons on faith. Just a quick rundown on faith. Write them down. This is Sermon 1, and we'll, then we'll get into the main lesson. John chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. I won't take time to read these. I'll just give you the meat of it. Jesus said, if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. All right? Can you buy that? Is that too strong a meat for you? <clears throat> John 14, 13 and 14, ask anything in my name, I'll do it. That even takes care of a thumb. Is Arthur trying to set up in there? Is that what's wrong? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> in Matthew 17 and verse 20, Jesus said, If you had faith of a grain of mustard seed, nothing would be impossible to you. Now, that's all things. Nothing that concludes all things. All right? Can you buy that one? <clears throat> Matthew 9 and 29, he said to the blind man, according to your faith, be it unto you. Now, somebody asked me the question this morning, said, well, why can't we pray and the Lord heals us? And I said, well, when you was a child or a baby, why did somebody change your diaper? Two reasons. One, it needed to be changed. And one, you were incapable of taking care of your own self. But after we become a man, we put away childish things. And we just don't pray and God just don't heal sometimes as we become mature. Why? Because we're capable of changing our own diapers. We have to grow up. Amen? And God allows these things to be present. That gives us an opportunity to show that we have developed and we're growing up and we can get victory over a thumb. Just talk to that dude. He's got to obey you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Matthew 9 and I said, according to your faith, bid unto you. So you can, you can make the thing happen. Now, in Matthew, or pardon me, Mark 9 and 23, talking to the father that has a lunatic son, he said, all things are possible to him that believes. Now, that's devastating. That, that's, you know, that's way out. But you can't work in this dimension except you believe that all things are possible to him that believes all things are possible. And somebody mentioned this morning is the key. The father said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. So there's nothing wrong with our faith. We don't need to pray for more faith. We need to work on our unbelief. See, your faith is pure and it'll get the job done. But it's the unbelief that's hindering us. In every area. Well, of course, 
Hebrews is the faith chapter, chapter 11, verse 1 said, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. So it's not yesterday's faith, it's not tomorrow's faith, it's present tense. And that's the substance. That's the material, that's the evidence of things hoped for, or the title deed, or the real fact. Verse 6 said, Now without this faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 11 and 6, without faith it's impossible to please God. God's looking for people that will have faith in Him. Now, I'm not going to tell you that it'll work instantaneously all the time. Sometimes you can pray and it just happens. And other times you've got to hold on to the rope. you just got to keep believing God. Just keep declaring it, keep trusting God, and say it's got to happen. And one of these days you wake up and it's gone. It may take a week, it may take a month, and I've worked as high as five years on some problems. But one day I wake up and say, hey, it's gone. So it still works, okay? That's sermon number one. <clears throat> one thing I want to bring back to your members that I've said before, you must forget what you believe the Bible says. See? You must find out what it really says. Because we've been taught a lot of things the Bible says that's not in the Bible. And somebody said already this morning and covered this particular area, but I want to cover it again. How do I understand the Bible? The Bible explains the Bible. If you want to know what the Bible says, know what's in the Bible. Now, I've got a lot of lexicons and encyclopedias and dictionaries and concordance and references, but if it's all said and done, here's the key. Know what's in the book, and you'll find the secrets in the book. All right? Now, we're talking about design, and we'll be going to... Let me give you the scriptures, then when I get there, you'll have them already wrote down. We're going to go to Michael 4 this morning and spend a little time. And a harmony, harmonizing chapter is Isaiah chapter 2, but we probably won't read there. But from Michael 4, Psalms 121, Psalm 72, and the latter part of 2 Kings 20, dealing with Hezekiah. And our real text this morning is in Revelation chapter 2, verse 26 and 27. Our reference introductory scripture is Matthew 23, 38 and 39. And we'll pick this up with Matthew 24 along with Revelation 8. So if you would like to turn to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, verse 38 and 39. Then we'll go immediately to the Revelations 2. Matthew chapter 23, verse 38 and 39. It says, Behold, your house, or your dwelling place, is left unto you desolate. And I hope you have a revelation of this chapter 23. Verse 39 says, For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth, or any more, or ever again, until, or till, you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now, here is the key to the overcoming company. Here is the key to the four horsemen in Revelation 6. And here is the key to the body of Christ, the sons of God, the 144,000, whatever you want to call us, here we are. Israel in the natural, Israel in the spirit, the world as a whole, will never see the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ until first they see him coming in a corporate body called a many-membered body. And this many-membered body is called he, is masculine, Whew, and it is blessed. I want to add that in there. And when the world begins to see those that comes in the name of the Lord that are blessed, we're going to get their attention. And I'm not talking about dollars and diamonds primarily. I'm talking about blessed physically and spiritually, then financially. Come on. And when you stay alive and you're blessed and you're healed and you're not bogged down with the mark of the beast, people are going to get excited and say, I go find out what those folks have got a hold of. Praise God. Raise your hands and tell the Lord you love him. Hallelujah. Now, in Revelation chapter 2, Verse 26 and 27. Now, we've been dealing with the book of Revelations in our own church 
this January 1. We're taking it verse by verse, breaking it down. And this is the verse that we, we're on now in our own Sunday morning services. I've been all year getting down to this verse. So I'll just play like I'm at home, okay? Verse 26, and he, everybody say he, because this is the key. He that overcometh keepeth my works unto the end. Oh, hallelujah. Now, this word in is a key word, and I won't elaborate on it long, but when Jesus said, He that endures to the end in Matthew 24, 13, He said, This is not the end. It's really the end of a certain operation or declaration, but really it institutes and installs a new beginning. Okay? So there's no such a thing as coming to an end. We're just coming to an end of an operation, but it opens the door for a new operation. So you've got to understand the, the, the King James translation has got some problems. Anyway... He that endures to the end, to him I'll give power over the nations. Now notice, we don't go to heaven, but we get power over the nations. Now this is, this is very important, and, and, and you get a hold of it. All right? And he, notice who? He. Somebody said, that's the Lord. No. He said, I will. That's the Lord doing the speaking here. I will give him. Him who? Him that the he. See it? It's called he, it's called him, it's called they, and so on and so forth throughout the Scripture. I will give him power over the nations, him that overcomes the corporate body. And he will rule them or shepherd them or control them or feed them or take care of them or plow them, what the definition says, with a rod of iron or the scepter of authority. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, can't be put back together, even as I have received of my Father. So here we find that it's not the Lord Jesus Christ, or it's not the Father, but it's the corporate body of Christ that's going to do the operation. All right? Now let's go back to where we was last night in Psalms 121. And remember, we're dealing with the section of the teacher in Psalms 107 to 150. Hallelujah. Are you still with me? Psalms 121. Where did we get to? Verse 1. Verse 2, Psalms 121, said, My help cometh from the Lord. Now he begins to explain who the mountain is, which made heaven and the earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. Now you're talking about being established. Oh, praise God. There's a helper in the Lord, or the Lord is the mountain that will establish you, and your foot can't even be moved. No wonder he told Joshua, he said, whatever piece of ground the sole of your foot steps on, said, I'm going to give it to you. But see, we've been like shifting sand with our Christian experiences and our endeavorments down through the years, but God's raising up a people, praise God, that's not going to be moved. Glory to God. And we're not going to be establishing our theology, we're going to be establishing the Word. The book says it. That's all. He that keepeth thee will not die. This word slumber is die. The Lord will not die. How many believes the Lord's not going to die? He that keepeth thee won't slumber or go to sleep and won't die. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Oh, glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. See, slumber is not sleep. I want you to see that, see, because most of us would read that and say, well, slumber is sleep. But slumber here is not sleep. He said he won't slumber or he won't die nor sleep. See it? So this just shows the power of the Lord. And the Lord is... Thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from, say it, all evil. Now, we've established what preserves are, haven't we? We've established how they're made. First, they've got to be peeled and skinned, stripped, washed, clean, then cut up, dissected, thrown in a pot, and then boiled. So if you wonder why you're having all your troubles, God's trying to make some preserves. Have you ever made preserves? See, we've had the fruits of the Spirit, and that's good. But you lay a piece of beautiful fruit over the windowsill, and it'll perish. But you take the same fruit and peel it and skin it and boil it and dissect it and cook it, add the proper preservatives, and seal it up. It'll last forever. The rest of the case. <clears throat> He shall preserve thy soul, or the whole me. Remember, the soul is nephesh, the whole man. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in. So that shows a preserving in operation. Whew. Well, you got to see a 
few little truths, see? If you're going out and you're coming in, that means you're doing something. You're moving. You're not preserved in the cemetery. You're preserved coming and going. Whew, glory to God. Help me, Lord. From the time forth even forevermore. So the preserving that God is trying to install is not a temporary preserving. It's an everlasting order. All right? Now remember, I'm just going to hit this very lightly because I don't have time to unlock it all, but Hezekiah was prayed this prayer, and this was the confirmation that God gave to him back through Isaiah. And remember what Hezekiah said in 2 Kings 20. He said, what will be the sign that I know the Lord's going to do it? What was the sign? The sundial would go ahead 10 degrees. Hezekiah said, man, anybody can do that. He said, I want it to back up 10 degrees. So Isaiah prayed, and the Lord backed it up 10 degrees. And Hezekiah had 15 years lengthened to his life. I mean, he's familiar with the story. So the, the key here is 10 degrees represents 15 years. Now, we know that 360 is the circumference of anything or the whole. We take a 24-hour day and divide it into 360, we come up with 15. So we find a space of time of 15 years for 10 degrees. All right? Now, in Revelations chapter 2 and verse 10, he said, you'll have tribulation 10 days. We worked on this verse of Scripture for many years, and we finally arrived that God was going to allow us to go through a tribulation period of ten days or a time till God really completes everything in us that needs to be dealt with. Now, number ten is completion. It's the whole. You can figure it in any book you want to read it in, and it's the number system. Ten is the same as one or a hundred or a thousand. It's the total. See? And God's going to allow us to come. And we just dealt with this third church. We read a portion of the fourth church this morning. But the third church, he said he would cast her into the bed of tribulation or affliction and even kill her children till they knew that he was God. So tribulation is not to do anything with the sinner at this particular junction. God's going to allow the church to be involved in the troublesome age that we are involved in till we know that he is God. We know about God and we have faith in God. But get ready for the experience of knowing God. And they that know their God shall do exploits or become creators and adventurers and do new things. Hallelujah. That's where we're headed. Amen. Now, in Matthew 24 and verse 22, he says, He shortened those days. There would be no flash save. Can you say amen? Now, you just write these down. We won't really maybe get time to go to them. But you see, but for... Why is he going to shorten the days? For the elect's sake... So some flesh can be saved. There's a key there. Get a hold of it. God's going to save some flesh. Now, this is hard for some folks to see this because we've been taught that we've got to lose this flesh and get us some spirits and get us some wings. See, and I'm not going to take away from that operation of God, but God's primary purpose is to save some flesh. See, in Noah's day, there wasn't but eight soul saved. Nephesh, eight flesh people saved. God didn't try to save the world as we know the world terra firma. He tried to save flesh. Huh? Bugs and flies, billy goats, mules, tigers, lions, and elephants, and people. Did he not? Look at the covenant. Genesis 8 and Genesis 9 tells you the new covenant that God made. And absolutely, he said, I'm not going to destroy all life off of the face of the earth anymore. Praise God. And that's the covenant. And you look at the rainbow. It's not just merely water. It's flesh involved in the rainbow. I don't have time to cover it. But praise God, the covenant relationship that God made with humanity, I will not destroy all flesh off of the face of the earth. As long as the sun shines and the moon shines and the world is, praise God, there's going to be flesh on this earth. Whew. Glory to God. Well... I'm getting excited. In Revelation 8, if I get back there, we'll deal with a, a short statement. It said, there's a half-hour silence under the fourth thunder. Revelation 10 deals with all the thunders. This is the fourth thunder. He said, there was a half-hour silence. And, of course, the silence is at an end of an operation. 
you have a big noise, and as soon as the noise is over, you got a silence. Two things are operating here. One of them, it shows me that we've come to an end of an operation. It's a silent time. Another thing shows me that we're not really hearing from God like we've been hearing, that God's letting us grow up and see if we can really stand on our own two feet, not talking to us in instructions like he's been talking to us. Another thing that's involved with this half-hour solace is that everything is being put together or coordinated or analyzed and getting ready for another operation. See what I mean? So if you take a half an hour silence and you divide a half into 15 years, you come up with seven years or seven years and a half. And if you take a little short time of shortening the days off of the seven years, you could have a seven-year period of tribulation pretty easy. So there's just some seed thought that you can think about. But we're headed for some devastating things, but praise God, in the midst of that, we're going to have victory. Glory to God. Raise your hands and tell the Lord you love him. Hallelujah! Now. Hallelujah. Let's turn over to Psalm 72. And I'll cut this very quick because it's, it's just too much. Psalm 72, verse 1. I've got 56 and a half minutes left. Psalm 72, 1 said, I'll give the king thy judgment, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. Now, primarily, David was talking about himself. The son Solomon was involved. But write this down just for a reference. In Psalms 110 and verse 5, he said, Through kings I'll strike the nations. Plural, kings. All right? Revelations 1.10 said, I've made you kings and priests. Okay? Now, thy righteous unto the kings, plural, son, or sons. Verse 2 he. Now we come back to the word he, the masculine, the corporate body of Christ. Who's he? He's the fellow that overcomes, or the group of people that overcomes. And he shall judge who? Thy people. With righteousness. Revelation 5.10, I believe it is. Yeah. He said he's made us kings and priests, and we shall dwell on the earth. Amen? Now, he said he's going to judge the people with the right judgment, and the poor with judgment, and the mountains shall bring peace to the people. Now, this is what we've been dealing with the last night and this morning. Mountains, natural and spiritual. But mountains are going to bring peace to the people. Now, we have to understand the, the, the thing that Noah landed on was what? A high mountain. 16,000 some odd feet up. But anyway, mountains are strongholds. And what what institutes or makes a mountain is a strong place, praise God, that's not moved by anything surrounding it. The mountain that, that Noah come down on was not moved. You've got to see this. Now, the water covered the whole earth, but it didn't cover the mountain that Noah was on at this junction, because when he come down, praise God, he rested on the mountain. Naturally. Jesus, in, in Matthew 17, he said, it after six days. Does that tell us anything? Six is the number of what? Man. How many knows we've come to the end of the sixth day? Glory to God. After six days, and I could get excited, but I'm trying to keep from getting excited. After six days, God took with him the elect, or the called out of the called out. The inner circle out of the twelve. Peter, James, and John had done what? Took them apart, up into. The Greek there says it's not on the mountain. Glory to God, Sister Miller, it's into the mountain. It's not good enough to get on the mountain. We've got to get into the mountain. He's the mountain. Raise your hands and tell him you love him. Hallelujah. And in the mountain he was metamorphosed before their very eyes. Hallelujah. Change. And they saw what was in the mountain. Hebrews 12, what? 22? You can write it down. We won't go to it. Hebrews 12, 22. He said, you have come to Mount Zion. Probably everybody wants to go to the mountains and everybody wants to go to heaven. Paul said, you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the... Living God, you come to where God lives, the dwelling places of God, hallelujah, and to an innumerable company of angels, and the spirits of just men being made perfect. My God, folks, we come to it. Let's be changed. My, 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 my. On the mountain or in the mountain. Well, see, I get excited. 
Verse 4, he shall judge the poor of the people, he shall save the children of the needy, and he shall break in pieces the oppressor. Now, you've got to understand that there's a, there's a much preaching here. But, the, but he that breaks the pieces of the oppressor is the corporate body of Christ, the overcomer. It's not the Lord Jesus Christ. It's him in you and I, working through and I. And he goes on and he talks. And there's days and days and days. Oh, God, what shall I do? They shall fear thee as long as the sun and the moon endure throughout all generations. So this shows us it's a perpetual operation. He shall come down like a rain upon the mowed grass, and a shower that waters the earth. And his days shall the righteous flourish, and the abundance of peace as long as the moon endures. And I'm going to get out of there because I just don't have time to really stay with it. Micah chapter 4. Praise God. Is it getting clearer or is it getting foggier? Getting clear. All right. Hallelujah. Micah 4. Now remember, Isaiah 2 works in harmony with this, and we won't deal with Isaiah 2, but Micah 4. But in the last days. Everybody say last days. Now that's not all the days, but that's all of the days of men. Now you've got to realize that man is coming to an end. In you and I, in world affairs, current events, whatever, the, the operation of man, they think they're going to work it out. Get one world government, one power, one beastly system, one money, and so on and so forth. But get ready, it's coming to an end. But it's only going to come to an end to a people that know their God and does not have the mark of the system. Because if you're marked with the system, then, beloved, you're a part of the thing that you're marked by. If you're still moved by it and controlled by it or get involved in it, then you're still marked by it. And God's raising the people up that we're not marked by the system. Whew, well, you're getting awful quiet on me. Read with me. Verse 1, Micah 4. But in the last days it shall come to pass. That's a positive God. I don't believe it. I could care less whether people believe it or not. I used to get upset when people didn't believe it, but it doesn't make any difference. I've heard people say, well, the Lord's Bible said it, and I believe it, and that makes it a fact. No, no, no. It's a fact whether you believe it or not. It shall come to pass that the mountain or the strong tower or the house, well, how many knows what the house is? That's the refuge or the dwelling place. That's where you live. In my Father's house, John 14, are many dwelling places. The dwelling place or the place of refuge or the house of the Lord is going to be established. God, there's nothing permanent, uh, temporary about that. There's no maybe so about that. It's going to be set in order. It's going to be established. And it's not going to be abiding just for a mere time. There's no time limit on the word established. The mountain or the house or the dwelling place of the Lord will be established perpetually without any days. No beginning or no end. Woo! Glory to God in the mountains. Or the mountains will be the strong house, tower of the house of the Lord. And it shall be exalted above all hills. These little hills that you're having problems with, and we call them mole hills, you know. There's a higher place. There's an establishment of God that's eternal, praise God, that's far above all the problems you've got. And I've got a man in my church, you know, I just love him, but he's always got problems. So I got on his case last weekend and I said, you start, start thanking God for your problems. Well, what do you mean? I said, that's a sure sign you're not dead. The only people who don't have problems are dead people. The only sign that you got that you're alive that you're not that you got problems. Now they're really not problems; they're only opportunities. They're stepping stones to show, praise God, that you can conquer, that you can overcome, that God's God, that the house of the Lord can be established. But it's only going to be established in the people that's got problems. The greatest blessing you got is a problem. That's the reason I praise God for old honey every day. I know it, <clears throat> but I'm big enough to get out. Go around and, and tell somebody, I thank God for my problem.
Did you ever see a child that was so spoiled that just didn't have no problems, and every time it had any kind of a whimper that his parents run to it and stuck a bottle in its mouth or give it a piece of cake, that child wasn't worth anything. But you give the child a problem. Now, see, that's the reason you go to school, praise God, to solve the problems. That's what this is. This is a schoolhouse. This is a training center. And it's going to be more severe as, as the years come and, and we progress. God's going to make the lessons more intense. It's going to turn the fire up. Okay, any beast that comes to the mountain is going to be destroyed. Ooh. You don't have to worry about fighting the devil just a few more months. Praise God. Just get a little higher on the mountain and the devil won't even know who you are. Job what? Nine, eight, twenty-nine. So there is the path. There is the path that the vulture's eye has never seen, and the lion whip has never walked on it. You want to find it? It's a good one. You ought to find it. That's the secret place. That's Psalms ninety-one. Job. Psalms ninety-one is the secret place. Somebody find it in Job right quick. 28 and 29 verse, Job. Well, I've even got it marked or not. Job chapter 28, verse 7 and 8. God gave me this. I tell you the night that God gave me this is the night that, that Johnston was on the plane and they swore him in. And the news was talking about it and Kenny had just been assassinated and Jacqueline and, and Johnson was back on the plane going back to Washington and I was driving down the number five in Northern California and Johnson was talking about uh, the, the assassination and all this and God gave me this verse of scripture and he gave it to me so strong and so powerful and I got so shook up I pulled that Lincoln off the side of the road just north of Fresno, and got out and got my briefcase out of the back and looked it up. <laughs> so when you get it this way, you know it's real. Now let's read it. There is a path. Everybody say, there is a path. Now I haven't really found it yet, but I know it's available. Whew, that no vulture knoweth, no fowl knoweth, that which a vulture's eye has not seen, I don't understand that. Well, here's what the Lord gives me. See, the heaven that you're trying to ascend to and the place you're trying to get, really, through the old order of teaching, the enemy's already possessed that and occupied that. See, when the sons of God presented themselves before God in Job's day, come on, the enemy was there too. But there is a place, bless God, that he has never touched. <laughs> There's a place he's never ascended to. It's the mouth of the most high place. Elion, God, the devil has never been there. He, who caught about Shaitan? He tried to ascend there. He said, I'm going to be like God. I'm going to elevate there. It's the thing that God promised Adam. It's the thing that God's promised you and I. But Lucifer has never defiled it and never touched it. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. But it is available. The lion's whip has not trotted it, nor the fiery lion, the fiery lion passed by it. And I'm going to leave it alone. But it is, it is Psalms, if you want to write down the reference, Psalms 91. You know this. It's also Isaiah 35. Are you familiar with Isaiah 35? There is a path. Praise God. No unclean thing. No raven beast. Called highway, holiness. Glory to God. It's a life. It's a way of life. No blinds on it. No lame. No hawk. Glory to God. It's Isaiah 35. And the redeemed of the Lord can walk in. Whew, well, let's praise God a little bit. I'm excited. Hallelujah, there's a place the redeemed can walk in. Well, glory to God. Isn't this exciting? That the Lord's Word can challenge us, praise God. That there's a dwelling place of God that the enemy's never lived in. And can't live in. Why? Because he's fell from that possibility of ever being able to live in it. Well, let's go on. Back to Micah 4. Now, I wanted to get down to the latter part of verse 1. And it shall come to pass, it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow into it. I think this is the key of this verse, that people shall flow into it. Now, we've had a problem over the years trying to 
enti- yeah, get them to come and, you know, and entice them and have all of these things to get them to come. And, you know, I'm not get some of these things. But I'll tell you one thing for sure. The hour is here and we're fixing to enter into an age. You're not going to have to worry about people coming. They're coming. They're going to come. They're going to come for a reason because they don't know which way to turn. Things are so devastating. They don't know what to do. And they see you surviving and they see the other side of the coin not surviving. And they're going to flow into it. So get ready for more problems. Well, so-and-so is such a problem. Well, thank God for so-and-so because Mr. So-and-so is coming and Mrs. So-and-so is going to come. That's got bigger problems than so-and-so's already got. Well, multiplication takes place. And many nations... That's not just a little old Mickey Mouse operation here, folks, we're involved in. This kingdom of God is a tremendous operation. This is the most fantastic thing that anybody could ever have an opportunity to be a part of. Thank God that you're living in this age. But Paul said, I see it, but I got a thorn in the flesh, and the thorn is because I got a lot of revelation. I see something that I'm not able to walk into because I'm born out of new season. But praise God, I'm born right on time. Hallelujah. Thank God. Nations shall come and say, come, let us go. All right. And many nations shall come and say, come, and let us go up to the mountains of the Lord and to the house of God and to the God of Jacob, and he will do what? Teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths, and the law shall go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now, the whole program is right here in this one verse. They're going to come, and they're not going to come uh, to aggravate or to distort or with a cantankerous attitude. They're going to come for one purpose, brother, and that's to learn the ways of the Lord. And the reason they're going to come to learn the ways of the Lord is because they want to live. Oh, no. It's not a geographical mountain. It's, it's a spiritual thing that God's going to bring them to. But I was thinking this morning, I heard the staff come and start rattling pots and pans early this morning. And I said, what we go through just to stay alive. Every morning we've got to get up. And in the military, you know, if, if, if you've ever been in the military, it's a 24-hour job to just keep the camp going and keep people alive. So you that are working 16 hours a day, get ready for the other eight and start working 24, because it's coming around the clock operation pretty soon. Well, they're coming. The nations are coming. Oh, you've got to be dedicated. You've got to be totally committed to a cause. Now, you can't be committed to Brother and Sister Miller or Doc. You've got to be committed to a cause. And let me tell you this, with all love, if you don't believe in it enough to give it your life, you don't believe in it. It'll cost you your life, what I'm preaching you. And I'll get a little stronger. It'll eventually cost you everything you got in the bank. Because you can't have no money and see the kingdom of God. Because if the kingdom gets so, so valid in your mind as it is in mine, you'll spend every dime you got, every bit of energy you got, and every thought and every word and every motive is to build the kingdom. And that's the only way it's going to get built. I don't know if they had a banking system in Noah's day like we've got. And I don't know if they had a bunch of silver certificates that draw rate of interest. But I have no scriptures where Noah went down to the bank every few days to see how much money he had. I imagine he was a scraping to try to get a few pennies to buy some more gopher wood. I'm sure they didn't give him the gopher wood. They thought he was crazy, so they weren't going to contribute to a lunatic. So he went out and bought him some gopher wood. That's right, you get one piece and go for another one. Do you know this is the only place in Scripture that the word gopher wood is used? There's a real message on the wood. I don't have time to preach it to you. And I can see after about, you know, say 30, 40, 50 years, the couch wore out in Sister Nori's living room. And I could just see her having a regular woman tantrum and saying, now, no, you know I've got to have a new couch. This thing is threadbare. It's wore out. Look what the grandkids have done to it. Let's be logic. Isn't that the way we think and act? Noah said, woman, 
I ain't worried about you. I ain't worried about the castle. I'm not worried about the grandkids. I've got an ark to build. And for a hundred years, Proacon, he labored and sweated and preached every day. Well, let's be practical. You get nothing for nothing but nothing. There's always efforts demanded. Take up your bed. Go and wash. Rise and walk. Come on, stretch forth your hand. There's always efforts demanded. God never does nothing for nothing. There's a reaction, praise God, for every action. There had to be fishy loaves. We're talking about preserving and storing up food. Now, I'm smart enough to know that I can't store up enough of food to feed the nations. But I am smart enough to know that God can take five loaves and two fishes and feed a multitude. You just got to have something to work with. You don't have to have a quality. Just have a certain quality. Glory to God. Just have the pure thing and it'll work. Well, let's praise God again. Hallelujah. Woo! I'm excited. Hmm. Hallelujah. Well, praise God. Just put your arm around somebody and tell them you love them. Glory to God. I feel God. Hmm. Well, now the word of the law of the Lord shall go forth out of Zion. Now, I know that you know that the Ten Commandments wasn't the law of God, that it was in operation many years before God put down his nature on stones. See, that's all the Ten Commandments was. God was trying to show his nature. I'm a God that don't steal. I'm a God that don't commit adultery. I'm a God. You Come on now. I'm a God that don't covet. Don't lie. Well, but we don't like laws. And I don't like laws. And I don't want to put nobody under no laws, but I'll tell you one thing for sure. Until we become under the law or the principle of God, we'll never arrive and become Zion. See? Now, the Word or the instruction, which is the mother, and this is the reason I teach the church age, is we know the church age is quickly coming to a close. And a lot of people don't understand where I'm coming from. But Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 closes in Revelation chapter 4. Now, the reason is that chapter 4 introduces the throne room operation as him king of kings and what he is, see. Now, as long as we're under Jerusalem or the mother, we're tutored and governed and taught and babied and forgiven. And come on, we might get a spanking, but it's all right and so on and so forth. But honey, under the law, now let's forget what we think the law is. I'm talking about under the law of the throne room of the operation of the Spirit of God, there's not going to be no excuse. If you run through the stop sign, you're going to pay the price. That's the right of honor, scepter of authority. See, you've got to see that. Mm. I know better than to do some of the things I do. Come on, I know better than this. But I put up with it because I'm still getting by with it. But one of these days, God's... Well... Can you say amen? Now, you may not have this problem. Brother Glenn don't have this problem, but I'm sure he's got something. <laughs> Some of us have got a thumb. <clears throat> now, so you're going to have Jerusalem in operation, and you're going to have the law in operation. The problem is, which dispensation or declaration do you want to live under? Do you want to always stay under tutors and governors? You never get an inheritance there. Do you? We're still children. But when a child grows up and realizes, praise God, that he comes under the government and the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, who's made me free from the law of sin and death, then we get an inheritance. Well, I... I'm going to leave this because I've got some more things that I want to say. But in Matthew 24, and someday I might come back and just do Matthew 24 word for word. But in Matthew 24, the, quiet, the disciples ask approximately four questions. And the first three questions is humanity. It said, when shall these things be? Verse 2. Everybody wants to know when. Amen. The second question is, what's the sign of the parousia or parousia, your presence coming alongside of them? 
Then, of course, the third one was what's the sign of the end of the age. Now, Jesus begins to answer the questions in verse 4. The answer to the first question, and Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceives you. So this shows me there's a possibility that we can be deceived. And I hate to say this, but I believe every person that believes some of the old stuff that we used to believe has been deceived. Even in the Holy Ghost filled church. We have been deceived. We are deceived. The, m the most blinded spirit that the enemy has put on us, we've all got to die. That's been deceived. That's deception in its highest order. Verse 5, he said, Many shall come in my name. They used to tell me this was the Antichrist. No, it's the Holy Ghost filled preacher that says that the Lord is the Christ. Or a Baptist preacher that's telling them that the Lord is the Christ. Every preacher says the Lord is the Christ. Everybody says he's Christ. Come on now. But they've deceived many. Rapture of the church. See, if, if, if you've been deceived by the rapture of the church, you'll never, never be challenged to prepare to stay. Or be able to stand in the hour. See, because the rapture, you know where it come from as well as I do. Margaret MacDonald, 1830. How many are familiar with when the rapture? Okay, there's no need to deal with it. But you see, this thing is so appeasing to the carnal mind and to the flesh, I don't have to do nothing. Just wait on the Lord. In 1938, when we first really got into this thing, I know people that sold their farms and their houses and everything because the Lord was going to come any minute. Before the revivals, over the Lord was going to come. But he hasn't come in that dimension yet. But they didn't know that he had come. Glory to God. Whew. So we have been deceived. People are still deceived. Multitudes and multitudes in the Valley of Decision, Joel says, and it pertains to this chapter 3, deals at the same time that we're talking about this morning. And in the day that you and I live in, when knowledge is increasing and we're putting men in, the, in orbit and on the moon, people are so deceived in Christianity and the works of God and in the Bible. They don't know nothing about it. Okay. So many is going to be deceived. Verse 6 said, You shall hear of wars, rumors of wars. See? That you be not troubled. Hallelujah. Now this begins to operate on the red horse. Wars, rumors of wars from Revelation 6. Now, the middle of verse 6, For all these things, everybody say things, must come to pass. Thank God they didn't come to stay. They have come, they have passed, and they will pass. But the end is not yet. Aren't you glad the end is not yet? Whew, when I begin to find out what, what God had in the, in the eons of time and had foreordained and predestinated His foreknowledge to come to pass, praise God, I'm glad that the end of the world didn't happen like I thought it was going to happen. We'd have missed out on the greatest part of it. Whew, but thank God... It, it's not the end. Oh, glory to God. And this is the new beginning I talked about a while ago. Nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, pestilence, earthquakes, and diverse places. This is part of the black horse operation now. But verse 8, all of these are the beginning of sorrow. And really, this is birth pains. There's a birth fix to take place, but there cannot be no birth without some labor. I never had a child, but I was stood by wives and by daughters and watched them have children and prayed for them, and I know that they come right down to the shadow of death to produce life. There's agony and there's pain and there's travail and there's groanings, praise God, that cannot be described. But when the new life comes forth, praise God, and they cut it in their arms and say, Looky here, glory to God, a man-child's been born. Hallelujah. We forget about the pains. We forget about the mourn the lawns and the agony and the heartaches and the sorrow and the disappointment and the unruly children and the unbelieving preachers and those that don't understand. Praise God. I could care less this morning because I see a man-child born. Hallelujah. And on the horizon and we're growing up and being developed and we're ready to sit on the throne and begin to rule and reign with Christ. Somebody praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Woo! Give the Lord a hand. My God. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. One more verse. Two verses. 13 and 14. 
But he, everybody put a circle around he now, because we're back to this corporate man here. That includes everyone that shall endure. And this is a powerful word, sermon within itself. The first principle of enduring is a made-up mind. Webster Dictionary says to endure is to have a mind ready to endure. Whew. An example, I believe I got this in Webster. Those Indians endured much pain without showing any sign of pain. So if you endure and complain about your enduring, you're losing the reward. <laughs> you can never complain about it or gripe about it or bellyache about it or go on about it or want some attention for it. Just go on, be a good steward, and absolutely be a good disciple and be a good servant and be servant unto all and under all, praise God. And the highest order that God ever calls you to do is to be a servant. Well, was he a servant? Did he complain? So get ready to endure all things all the way to the end, to the new beginning. You've got to see this new beginning in here. If you don't, you get discouraged. You don't just endure till everybody's annihilated. We endure right on through the tribulation period, praise God, and become the new beginning. Hallelujah. Isn't that fantastic? And he that endures to the end or to the new beginning, the same shall be saved. Or to, and let me tell you, there's no body salvation really... At, this is a little strong, until the water's receded and the door of the ark is open and God walks out of new humanity, praise God, without the smell of smoke on their garments and they're still alive after all the devastating things that takes place. And glory to God, that's going to be the proof of the pudding. Somebody say amen. Woo! Man, glory to God, I want to stay alive. And I believe these cooks want me to stay alive. That's the reason they got up this morning and started the cooking. See, if you didn't care for a living, you wouldn't even get up and cook in the morning. You'd just stay in the bed and die. I told you about the slaw, didn't I? But anyway, salvation comes at the end of enduring. 370 days, the water covered the face of the earth. Whew. What was the first thing the turtle dove brought back? Sign of life. I don't know how many nuclear bombs is going to fall, and I don't know how devastating things are going to be, but I tell you, somewhere in the midst of it all, there's going to be an olive branch. I'll cut all of them that. And God's going to have a bird that's going to find it. Y'all ain't hearing me. Glory to God. I said, there's a tree of life still in the midst of paradise of God, and God's got a Holy Ghost filled up that knows where it's at, and we're going to find it and bring back the evidence there's life on the face of the earth, and we're going to live, and our children's going to live, and our children's children's going to live. Somebody praise God. Church, we can't let nothing hinder us this morning. Disobedient children or unconsiderable parents or people that don't understand and those that ridicule and throw stones... Don't even let it bother you this morning. Just look up. Our redemption draws nigh. Praise God. And we're closer to the goal this morning than when we was when we started. And we're not dead yet. Praise God. We're still alive. We're still enduring. And we're still remaining. And praise God. We're going to be here when the Lord comes and have some fruit and to show Him, praise God, that we're working for Him and we're alive. It thrills me. Verse 14 says, The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness or demonstration or an illustration unto all nations, and then the end shall come. And this is where the cross is. This is where the burden is, that the gospel of the kingdom. Now, we've had evangelism, and I'm not throwing those stones at We had to have that. We have, we have invitations every year. And it had been just too long ago, somebody came to me and said, they've heard the message of baptism, they've heard the message of healing and the Holy Ghost, and God loves them and salvation, but said they've never heard the gospel of the kingdom. So the greatest opportunity we have this morning is to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Hallelujah. Now with the great privilege and opportunity also comes a great responsibility. This is the reason it's going to cost us of our substance to get this gospel out. You see, the mother church is not going to support it. Old Pentecost is not going to support it. The Baptist is not going to support it. And the people who going to support the gospel of the kingdom is the people that believe in the gospel of the kingdom. The people that built the boat is the people that believed in the boat. And the people that believed in Pentecost was those that supported Pentecost. And I'm going to tell you, God's got a higher order. It's the Mount Zion Company. It's the overcomers. It's the gospel of the kingdom. And we that believe it, we're going to support it. 
and give our life to it. Hallelujah. And it shall come to pass. Can you say amen? Glory to God. Hallelujah. Let's read just a little bit from this Revelations 8. I'll give you a quick outline. I'm, don't, I'm not going to push to get to the end of that tape. A lot of things take place in Revelations 8. Revelations 8 and 1 said when he had opened the seventh seal. Now, in closing out the operations of the seal, first we must be familiar with the opening of the first seal, the white horse rider in Revelation 6. Now, I know we was taught in theology that that was the Antichrist. But let me tell you something. Only kings of dignity ride white horses. Huh? We have no statuating scripture that the Antichrist rides a white horse. This is theology. I don't know if you're familiar with theology, but they, tell, they told me that the white horse rider Revelation 6 was the Antichrist. No, the Antichrist never conquered. He's not going to conquer. And he's not going to go forth to conquer. Revelation 19 explains all this, that he comes on a white horse and those that's with him are on white horses. These are dignitaries. These are kings and priests. So the first seal introduces kings and priests. Revelation 6 and 1. Glory to God. And we begin to rule and reign. Conquer. And we're going forth to conquer. I have no intentions of being defeated. Come on now. I'm already in the saddle, praise God, and got the reins in my hand, and I'm conquering. Hallelujah. So that's the first seal, and, and then we go on down and pick up all the rest of them in chapter 6. But when we get to chapter 1, we find that the, the real sealing of the body of Christ has not taken place, and we got four angels on the four corners of the earth holding back the four winds, waiting for something. So the servants of God get sealed. And you see, if you're not sealed, you're not going to stand the winds. What do you mean, get sealed? You're going to have to make up your mind to endure to the end. You're going to have to make up your mind to win, or you'll lose. Let me get it a little stronger. You're going to make up your mind this morning to win or you are a loser. That's strong meat. And I, I preach this in my own church, so I'll preach it in this and praise God. But I want you to know one thing for sure. If you don't make up your mind this morning to win, you've already lost. You can't look at the circumstances. That's the reason I want you to look at the good thumb. Quit looking at the bad thumb. Look at the good thumb. The first thing you know, the bad thumb will be just like what you see. Come on, praise God. According to your vision and your faith, praise God. As long as we look at the circumstances, we never find the solution. But hallelujah, when we quit looking to the circumstances and start having faith in God, the solution always comes about. Somebody praise Him. Hallelujah. My God. But there's a group of people get sealed before tribulation. What I want to throw out here in Revelation 7. Then there's a group of people that gets a white robe during tribulation. So you can be a part of the first or part of the last. The prerogative is yours. You can get sealed before it starts. With some of us this morning, I believe we're already sealed. Or you can go ahead and, and war through the thing and get you a white robe after it's all over with. I just seem to have my white robe and my white horse this morning if it's all right with you. I just soon start ruling and reigning this morning. There's no need to wait another seven years or seven months or whatever. Let's rule this morning. Say, I'm a conqueror. I'm more than a conqueror. Right now. Hallelujah. Woo, glory to God. So we close out the operations of the seal by introducing Revelations 1 and 8 with a half hour silence we just touched on a while ago. So it shows me we've come to an end of an operation of seals. And we're getting ready to really do something. And he saw the seven angels, verse 2, which stood before God, and to them was given seven trumpets. So there's no need of blowing the trumpets as long as the seals are in operation. What's the operation of the seals? Jesus said all of these are the beginning of sorrow. That's all Revelation 6 is. It's the beginning of sorrow. It's the introductory to the troublesome times that's coming on the face of the earth. It's, a, it's in perfect harmony. I didn't know this for only by the Spirit in my own studying for years and years. And one day I found some commentaries and some books and found out that I wasn't the only guy that figured this out. But Revelation 24 is not a thing in the world, but a fulfillment of Revelation 6. Or Matthew 24 and Revelation 6 work in parallels. Okay? But when that's over, and the trumpets begins to sound, whew, things begin to operate. Hallelujah. 
And in verse 5, it talks about the thunder, and this is the third thunder. Now, remember, the first thunder opens up the throne room in, in chapter 4. The second thunder opens up the, the seals in chapter 6. And here's the third thunder, and it introduces the trumpets. And the trumpets really begin to bring devastating things. Listen to verse 5. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire off the altar and cast it into the earth. What does that tell me? It tells me it's God's program out of the heavenlies, the operation of God happening on the earth. Now, that's not too hard to understand, is it? It's out of the heavenlies, so it's not in heaven. It's in the earth. <sighs> Glory to God. And there were voices. Here's a corporate body. And there were thunderings, still corporate. And there was lightnings, it's still corporate. And there was an earthquake. And there's a message here on this earthquake, but I won't deal with it this morning. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Now, seven, of course, is God's number. It's a perfected number, and it's all through the Scriptures. And this is going to be a perfected work that God's going to bring to pass. The first angel sounds in verse 7. And there followed hell, fire, mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth. Okay? And the third part of the trees were burned up. And all the green grass was burned up. I'm going to spiritualize this a little bit, and I'm going to realize it a little bit. The real part of it is there's real trees. <clears throat> and there's a real earth. We have real neutron bombs that will burn them up. Or hydrogen bombs. Revelation 7, he says, don't hurt the grass. Amen? Or the trees, or the people, until they're sealed. But now, he says, turn it loose. See, you couldn't stand. You just barely can't get victory over a thumb. No, I'm not. I'm just, you, you, you're just handy this morning. How many of we just barely can keep the victory over the little foxes? But God's a seal in some of our minds. And the things that he doesn't allow happen in chapter 7, he lets it begin to happen over here in chapter 8. And some trees are going to get hurt. How many of those your trees, too? And if you get over here on this black horse rider through the famines and the earthquakes and things that happened in chapter 6, you find out that that's instituted to kill a fourth of humanity. See, God doesn't accidentally do anything. The flood didn't kill just a fourth. It got the whole. All but the eighth, the new beginning number. But the thing that God's a fixing to allow to come on the face of the earth, fact is, I think it's already here in operation. We just, we, the fire hasn't gotten really intense yet. But it has a purpose to destroy one-fourth of humanity. That's over a billion people. That's a lot of people. But here he talks about a third. Chapter 9 deals with a third. I hope this third is a part of the fourth. If it's not, if we take the fourth away from the four billion, we've got three billion left. We get over here, we get a third, we got another billion gone. So really, by the time we get past the vials in chapter 9, we don't have but half of us left. <sighs> well, but there's nothing to be excited about. It's something to be challenged with, praise God, to be a part of that that's alive and remains. And you'll not survive if you're not sealed. And this is going to hurt. Now, listen to me real close. See, in this operation, the prayer of faith is not going to work. The anointing with all is not going to work here because we come over to the place you've got to have it when you get here. Or you're going to be subject to destruction. So thank God that we've got what we've got to work with right now. Fasting and praying and anointing with all and all of this. And I'm not against it. Casting out devils, I'm for it 100%. I just dealt with my church. I called all my young people up and prayed for them, prophesied and cast out devils in them last Sunday morning. I'm not against that. But I'm going to tell you, we've got to grow up, praise God, to the place that we're so developed that there's no devils that even come close to us. And if it did, it'll just get burned up, praise God, and consumed by the fire of the living God. Hallelujah! I think I better quit. I'm just wound up. Glory to God. Hallelujah. But if we get sealed, some people jump on me and, and I say, well, I'll tell you who I am and where I am. In my experience, I believe I'm right where Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego was. I'm at the door of the furnace and my God's going to deliver me. 
And just for chance he don't, I'm still not going to bow down and be sealed with the Babylonian beastly system. I done made up my mind a long time ago. Let's stand and praise God. And I'm going to turn it to Brother. All right, let's stand. Praise God. Hallelujah. Just raise our hands and worship the Lord. Father, we praise you for this beautiful place. I praise you for the precious people that's gathered here this morning. God, I feel such a spirit of, of receptive and accepting, God, the word of the Lord. And I thank you for Brother and Sister Miller and the campgrounds here. And Father, I ask the Holy Ghost to have preeminence over the remaining years in this campground and on the lives of this people. And I ask the Spirit of the Lord to seal the word this morning, God, that's spoken. Satan, you can't steal these words. Satan, you can't rob this people of what's been preached here this morning. Satan, you're a deceiver, you're a liar, you're a robber, but we have authority over you. We accept the purpose of God this morning and be sealed in the name of the Lord. Protect us, Father, as we travel on the highway and keep us, God, in the grace of God in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home.